Hello everyone and welcome to Indian Genes. My guest today is an astronomer based at the University of Southern Queensland. He has been leading research into the search for and study of exoplanets, working closely with NASA. He completed his postdoctoral research at the University of New South Wales and was a teaching fellow at the University of Durham in UK. His postdoctoral was completed at the University of Bern in Switzerland and his DPhil from the University of Oxford. He has written over a thousand papers on areas related to astronomy. Our conversation today covers a range of topics from telescopes to extraterrestrial life, galaxies, stars, planets, including footballs and billboards in space. You're going to have a great time listening to him. And I now present to you my very engrossing conversation with Jonathan Horner. Hello, Jonathan, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here on Indian Genes. Uh, let us start by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. I had a real amount of good luck, actually. When I was a very small child, about five years old, my parents were supportive and they were recording TV shows for me. And they accidentally recorded part of a television show called The Sky at Night which was an astronomy program presented by a guy called Sir Patrick Moore in the UK. It was the longest right university to study at. So when I was 18, I moved to the University of Durham in the north of England, and I spent four years studying for a master's degree in physics and astronomy. From there, I moved to Oxford, where I spent three years doing my PhD. I finished that in 2003, and since then, I've been getting paid to do my hobby, essentially. I've been doing research as my day job and getting to relax and really enjoy the academic life with ups and downs and lots of travel and getting to look into some really cool questions and try and figure out what the answers to them are. That's amazing. And we'll definitely get into uh, a little bit more detail because I do, I am aware that you have uh, released a lot of papers on the studies and observations that you're doing. And we probably can talk about it uh, a little bit later as well. But your, your resume simply is amazing, uh, Jonathan. So uh, if, if we had to go back, and I want to just address this to my listeners and, and put some kind of a, a progressive timeline to this, how, how do you see this as starting, as when we talk about science today with empirical observations and uh, experiments that can be repeated or predict results? How did this all start for all of us? Would, would you be able to, or could we just discuss a little bit about that before we come to where we are today? Sure. And I mean, I will stress at this point, I'm by no means an expert. I was right. brought up through the UK education system and went through university in the UK. And everything that we were taught about scientific history had a very Western and a very Anglo slant. So it was all about Europe. It was all about Britain, the evolution of the Royal Society. And for the past 400 years, that's obviously been very important. You had the Renaissance, you had the development of the modern scientific method. What I've learned, though, particularly since I've come to Australia, is that there's a much longer heritage to science as we know it that goes back tens of thousands of years. And I'm obviously not the best person to talk about this, but the traditional owners of the land in Australia, the indigenous people, astronomical heritage that goes back 65,000 years, and that embodied continual study of the night sky and looking at patterns that repeated themselves and fitting that into their day-to-day -day lived experience. And I think that's probably true of every culture on the planet. Every culture can look back and will, it will have had a very intimate relationship with space, with the night sky. You can think of, for example, the ancient Egyptians who studied the night sky and knew that when the bright star Sirius was first visible in the morning sky, after it had disappeared from the evening sky a couple of months earlier, when it first became visible just before sunrise, that was a very important time of the year, right. because that was the time of the year the Nile was about to flood. And so I think even going back thousands and tens of thousands of years, people studied astronomy, they studied the night sky, and used it as a way to better understand their place on the Earth, to have a feel culturally for where they came from, but also to be able to navigate geographically, to find their way around, but also to navigate in time, to be able to tell when, for example, would be a good time to go fishing, when the fish were spawning, or when would be a good time to plant crops. And I think it's from that kind of study that our knowledge of the universe really began. And in fact, researchers here in Australia are now studying the records, the oral history of the indigenous Australian people, because that gives us a record of astronomical events that predates 
the recorded Western history and allows us to study things that simply occurred too long ago for us to have any other record. So there's a lot of really interesting interplay here, and I think it's something that in the next decades we'll learn a lot more about as our knowledge of this goes from being very, like I say, Anglo-centric and European-centric to being much more inclusive of other cultures and their histories. Right. And I think this also follows with the Sumerian civilization, who probably were the first people to to actually take on to writing, because they have been signs of them actually knowing the uh, planetary system and the revolutions. But that uh, we don't really have any records of that. But as you have just mentioned, it's really exciting because the same thing probably happened here in India as well with the philosophers first uh, looking up at the stars and and in India, the belief was that, uh, you know, knowledge had to have applications. And the first science in India was the study of linguistics. And that led to the study of acoustics and music. So I think that is pretty interesting that it all happened. And then we moved in towards the probably when it all got uh, uh, theorized was towards the Greeks. We would move towards probably the 15th century, I guess, when things just started getting really exciting because we started now recording and uh, documenting all this. I think so. It's interesting. I think a lot of things will have been discovered many times and then forgotten or discovered by one culture and another. There are great examples when you look back at, for example, the ancient Babylonians who knew the length of the day and the length of the year to incredible precision. They had recorded observations for hundreds and thousands of years ancient observations from various different places around the world, including Chinese tablets and Babylonian tablets, have been very important for people studying comets. But in a lot of cases, it really was recording things and just trying to predict. There wasn't really any uh, experimental ideas, and there was no real effort to understand the why of how things work. It was much more about trying to understand what you could predict. It's a little bit different. It's, I guess, like the difference between being able to drive a car and being able to build a car. Right. That's kind of the fundamental difference. And what was strange about the Greeks was that they put great store in trying to understand how the world worked, but they were very much against actually doing experimentation. That was viewed as being menial and beneath them, and you should be able to solve everything purely by the power of the mind. And the most beautiful solution was the right one. And it was only, like you say, in the 15th century that we started to move away from that. And that process began with ever-improving observations, better observations that eventually showed up the flaws in some of the beautiful ideas that had explained things well enough, but as we got better data, those explanations began to fall over. And a really good example of that is the Greek belief that the Earth was the centre of the universe, which a lot of people say was shot down by Copernicus. Right. But in actuality, the idea that the sun was the center of the, the universe, or at least the center of the solar system, had been around for a long time before then. And it was this interplay of how you can explain what we see, how you can predict what will come in the future, that really, in the end, made the decision that, no, really, the Earth is not at the center, the sun's at the center. That was done through incredible observations by people like Tycho Brahe. The analysis of those observations by Brahe's student, Johannes Kepler, following on from the Copernican ideas being published and being so controversial, they really brought it back to the forefront of people saying, well, hang on, is there more we can look at here? Exactly. And it would then centre around probably Galileo and his telescope. Would you actually place the origins of the telescope with Galileo or would you look at it differently? It depends who you talk to. I mean, Galileo certainly wasn't the inventor of the telescope. Typically, people refer to a Dutch watchmaker called Hans Lippershe right. as being the inventor of the modern telescope, and that was a year or two before Galileo's observations. But again, talking to people who have knowledge of other cultures and are looking more into scientific history, there are suggestions that Arab astronomers back in the 10th century and 11th century may have had access to telescopes, and explorers may have done. So again, it might be one of these technologies that was invented, then forgotten, then invented again. Right. should be said, though, that I don't think that is definitive yet. It's something that is discussed, but it's still an open question. And like many things in science, the best questions are the ones we can't answer yet. Would you then uh, look at uh, post-Galileo or the observations made there? What exactly changed from that moment? Because like you've just covered, we moved from geocentric to a heliocentric uh, solar system now. And how did that play out after that? 
We did. Now, I think the idea of the heliocentric system was really gathering weight and gathering support because the logic of it was becoming indisputable anyway. Galileo's observations are really put the final nails in the coffin for the geocentric model. Right. Because of some of the things that the model predicted as an aside, you know, it said that the Earth was at the center and everything else went around the Earth one way or the other. So when Galileo observed the four largest moons of Jupiter, now known as the Galilean satellites, right. he saw them moving around Jupiter. Now, if they're moving around Jupiter, they're not moving around the Earth. So that immediately was suggesting that the idea that everything goes around the Earth was simply wrong. He also observed the phases of Venus. And that's pretty much a telltale sign that Venus must go around the Sun, not around the Earth. Simply from the way the phases were and where Venus was in the sky when it had them, it made much more sense that Venus was orbiting the Sun and we were orbiting the Sun further out. And the phases were just a matter of perspective of the way that we looked at Venus. Another of his great observations was that he turned his telescope on the Moon and he observed shadows he could tell that the moon was not perfectly smooth it was a flawed surface it had mountains and valleys craters and the lengths of those shadows changed through the course of the lunar day so they weren't just dark patches on the surface they really were the effect of a tall mountain throwing shade as the sunlight fell on it and the length of the shadow changed as he went through the lunar day and that again was pretty revolutionary because the idea until then was that everything in the heavens was perfect, pure, smooth. Right. So that kind of threw that out of the window. So it was one of these things where he added a great weight of evidence to the arguments for the sun-centered rather than the earth-centered solar system. And then if we would have moved forward from there in, in your field of study or in your field of research, when or what time frame or person do you see as a big shift that happened towards actually using telescopes or using advanced telescopes to look back up into the sky? Because uh, I don't know, I guess the, the telescopes in the older days would have been using lenses and then we moved to mirrors, if I'm, if I'm right. We did, and through the 1600s, there were any number of leaps forward that were made. And every time that a telescope was improved, people discovered new things with it. You think of people like Cassini, the great Italian observer, who was one of the first to note Saturn's rings and explain them. Galileo, he had a telescope that wasn't quite good enough, so he saw Saturn not as a planet with rings, but as three blobs, with the bigger blob being in the middle, essentially. And it took the development of a better telescope, better optics, for that discovery to be made. It should be said that lens-based telescopes, refractors, continued to be widely used, and in fact there are still some that are used today. Mm -hmm. And reflecting telescopes that were developed in the second part of the 1600s were an improvement but for a long time you had both reflectors and refractors being built right. and being used by different scientists it's only in recent years when we've got to the truly enormous telescopes that we've hit the point where refracting telescopes can't compete and that's purely because to make a refracting telescope that big the glass of the lenses would be so heavy they would deform under their own weight they're just no longer physically feasible and that was the final nail in the coffin for refracting telescopes they have other problems as well but it really does get to the point that when you have the biggest telescopes they have to be reflectors refractors just don't work right and i think that you you, you also would be referring to probably something like the james webb space telescope which is is over 30 years in in the making and that is really going to take us to an ultra deep hubble field and and probably show us things we've never seen before yeah, with every new generation of telescope, we push the boundaries back of what we know. And I, I like to think of astronomy as being this beautiful dance between theory and observation. People go out and look at the night sky with a new instrument and they discover new things. They see things happening that we can't explain. And then we build theories around that to say, we think that this happens because whatever the theory is. And if this theory is correct, then the next generation of telescopes that can push further should see this, this and this that we've never observed before. Then you have the next generation of telescopes that can test those theories by looking at things that we didn't know were there but the theory predicted and back and forth like this. And it's really kind of elegant the way that it works. Things like the James Webb Space Telescope, once it launches in the future, are a vital piece in that because it will allow us to look at things more clearly than ever before 
and really provide important tests of all of our theories. Right, and I think it would be using uh, infrared in order to cover the deep uh, distance between what we're seeing. Because uh, if an object is that far, then the light being emitted from it would be more in the infrared spectrum, right? It depends. If you're looking at the most distant things in the universe, they are very heavily redshifted. They're moving away from us. And so you do move a lot of their emission into the infrared. But the other advantage of observing in the infrared more locally, say within our galaxy or within our local cluster of galaxies even, is that light that we see, optical light and short wavelength light, is very effectively scattered by dust. And you see that that's why the sunset is red, essentially, and it's why the sky is blue. Longer wavelengths of light pass through the dust more easily than shorter wavelengths. So when the sun is low in the sky, the red light passes through the atmosphere fairly well because it's got a longer wavelength, it doesn't interfere with dust. But the shorter wavelength light, the yellow and the blue light, is scattered very effectively. You can extend that to the infrared. The infrared radiation is scattered even less by dust, which means if we observe at infrared wavelengths, we can peer inside clouds of dust to see what's happening on the inside. The optical light is scattered and removed and we just can't see anything. But if you look at these longer wavelengths, it almost allows you to see through the dust to see what's beyond. And that's really important. The other thing infrared observations let us do is look at the atmospheres of planets around other stars, for example. Correct. Look at the energy emitted by those planets. And even in the solar system, it allows us to better understand and to better stand better understand, sorry, and better study mm. the small objects in the solar system in particular. We can learn a lot in infrared that we can't when we're only observing in the optical. And would the sunlight uh, have an impact on this if you are observing, because that's infrared as well, and you would have to have some kind of a reflector to, to manage that? No more than you would do if you were looking in the optical. So the sun emits wave light of all wavelengths, from gamma rays and x-rays all the way through to radio waves. Mm. It emits most of its energy in the optical, but it does emit lots of energy in the infrared. Okay. But if you're not pointing at the sun, there's nothing scattering that infrared radiation back into your telescope. So you have to avoid getting too close to the sun in the sky, and most telescopes won't observe within, say, 30 degrees or even 60 degrees of the sun in the sky right. for that reason. But if you're pointed away from the sun, you don't have a problem. And having said that, within the solar system, I just want to come back to something that I want you to, to, to clarify or clear for us once and for all. What's the story with Pluto? So I grew up that Pluto was a planet, and then it was not a planet, and then it was again a planet. What's the final count now, and why? It isn't the first object to go through this either. The first asteroid that we discovered, Ceres, mm. was considered a planet for almost 130 years, and right. nobody gets worried about that anymore. Right. For me, Pluto never should have been a planet. It was kind of misclassified. But it's something fundamental to how we study the cosmos, right. or how we study anything, really. If you take the analogy of a human lifetime, you know that we live continuously. We live at one day per day. Every day you wake up and you're one day older, and mm. it's a continual process. And so we're all human beings. But to make our lives easier, whether it's for a legal sense or whether it's from a personal sense, we break a human lifetime down into parts. You are a toddler, and then you're a school child. Then you are suddenly old enough to drive. You're old enough to vote. Right. You can work, and then eventually you become a pensioner. And all of those changes happen at a very specific time. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, when I grew up, I could start learning to drive when I was 17 years old. So the day before my 17th birthday, hmm. I couldn't learn to drive. And then suddenly at midnight, miraculously, <laughs> you, now you were allowed to drive. To drive. Yeah. yeah. I'm no different. Right. It's just uh, the clock has ticked and we've gone across an arbitrary boundary. And it's the same thing through science. And certainly in astronomy, if you think about the objects in the solar system and the objects in the universe, there are very few hard divisions. Right. You start with tiny grains of dust, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you get to the biggest stars. And in between that journey, there are a few physical processes that change, but there are no gaps where you say there is nothing between this size and another size. It's a continuum. Now, that is a bit of a problem for scientists because we want to be able to study that, and we want to look at objects that are similar to one another. And so that's why we put in place these different definitions, like planet, like star, like brown dwarf, which is something between a planet and a star, right. planetesimal dwarf planet. In the case of Pluto, I can take you back to our analogy of a human being. You could be walking down the street and see a really big 
young person in front of you, really big and burly. And from a distance, you think they must be 18, 19 years old. They're definitely an adult. Mm -hmm. That's what we thought when we saw Pluto from a large distance away. It looks like it's really big. It looks like it's certainly big enough to be a planet. But it's only when we got to see it more up close and personal that we realize it's really the equivalent of a young teenager who's just had a growth spurt at a young age. Right. From a distance, it looks like an adult, but it isn't quite there yet. So it's a bit like a 13 or 14 year old that is almost an adult, but is still not very good at tidying up after itself, for example. And that's one of the challenges we face as astronomers is where you put these divisions in is around how we can study and how we can understand the cosmos. And Pluto has much more in common with the other objects that are out beyond Neptune, the trans-Neptunian objects, Got it. than it does with the eight planets that we recognize today. So that's why we currently don't call Pluto a planet. If we turn things around and we move that boundary so that Pluto was a planet, the end result will be that in our solar system, we probably end up with several hundred planets names to remember. And that's a bit of a pain for everybody else. But mm -hmm. for scientists, it's not a very useful definition then, because it means we can't study the two different kinds of object. I totally get that. And I understand why that would have happened as well. And uh, Jonathan, I would just want to want to move back to to where we started uh, and, and where we've come to. So if you could just take us through a little bit about the Earth and, and the creation there, because we talk about its uh, original impact with the planet Tia and the creation of the Moon. So could you give us a little bit of a background on, on that process? Sure. The point to make here, I think, is that astronomy is very different to all of the other sciences. If you do physics or chemistry or biology, you do experiments. If you're a biologist and you want to know how a bacteria works, you can put it in a Petri dish and pour acid on it and see how it copes with acid. Right. Or if you're a chemist, you can mix things together and make them blow up. But in astronomy, in the main, we're observers. It's yeah. slightly different. And so what we have in the solar system is like a big detective story. Mm -hmm. We have a crime scene, which is the formation of the planets that happened a long time ago, four and a half thousand million years. But in front of us, we have all the evidence, all of the clues we need to try and disentangle it. And that's what astronomers do. And the more we observe, the better we get. And now we have better telescopes. Now we have some of the spacecraft we've got. We can also start to examine the formation of planets around other stars. And that gives us even more information to what happened at home. And all of that gives us our current narrative, our current story of how the planets formed. And it started with the formation of the sun. The planets kind of formed as a byproduct of the sun forming right. in something we call a huge, a giant molecular cloud, big cloud of gas and dust that could be so big that light would take a hundred years to pass from one side to the other. Wow. But so dense with matter that light couldn't get through, it's totally opaque. And they're the kind of things, incidentally, that we try to peer into with infrared space telescopes like James Webb. Got it. The infrared light allows us to peer into these clouds and see what's happening on the inside. Now, if you imagine one of those clouds starting to collapse under gravity, the more it collapses down, the stronger the gravitational pull between the different clumps will be. They pull together faster and faster. And within that giant cloud of gas and dust, you get little clumps forming, collapsing on their own, and they're going to be new stars eventually. And as those clumps get smaller, their density gets higher, and the temperature at their cores gets higher, the pressure goes up until eventually they reach temperature of about 10 million degrees. And that's the point at which nuclear fusion begins, where hydrogen nuclei will fuse together to make helium nuclei and give off some energy. Right. And that's the point at which the star is born, at which point the radiation from the star balances gravity pulling back in. Everything stabilizes out and the collapse stops and you have a star. The solar system formed around the sun while that process was happening. All that gas and dust that was falling inwards had a little bit of rotation just because nothing in space sits perfectly still. Right. Everything is nudging everything else. As the gas and dust collapse inwards, it spun quicker and quicker, which is due to something called the conservation of angular momentum. And okay. that's the same thing if you try to spin with your arms outstretched and then you pull them in, you'll spin more quickly. It's the same process. Would that be one of the things that also first led us to dark matter? And we can come back to that later. Yeah, so the way in which things orbit around the centre of mass was one of the things that pointed out dark matter, and that comes to our studies of galaxies rather than studies of stars and planets when they're forming. Right. And we will come back to that later yeah, sure. on, I think. In terms of the formation of the solar system, though, you get all this material falling inwards and spinning. The closer it gets, the faster it spins. And as it comes in towards the sun, it collapses into a disk of material around the sun. So you can imagine the young sun surrounded by a big flat pancake shape 
of dust and gas. And it's in that disk of dust and gas that the planets formed. And it started out very slowly because all you have is dust and gas. And when dust grains collided together, there was a chance they'd stick and make a bigger dust grain. Right. And then that dust grain would collide with another and you'd gradually grow dust that got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you get to things that were kilometers, hundreds of kilometers across, and eventually you grew planets. Now, if you grew your planet big enough, say 10 times as massive as the Earth, it would get enough mass that it could start swallowing, gathering the hydrogen and helium gas from the disk of material. And that's how you grew the giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. But there was only a certain amount of time where you were able to do that because when the sun really got active, when it really got going, it blew away the remaining gas and dust and left behind a lot of rocky and icy material mm -hmm. and the planets that we see today. And it's at that stage that you got the really catastrophic big collisions because in the inner solar system, there were lots of large objects. There weren't just the four planets we see today, but there were lots of things we call oligarchs or planetoids, mm -hmm. the protoplanets. And the last stages of planet formation in the inner solar system were very violent because it was all these objects stirring one another up and colliding with each other until space was cleared out a little bit. One of those big collisions between, like you say, an object that people often call Thea and the Earth was the thing that we think led to the formation of the moon. And it sounds a bit like science fiction that you have two planets smashing together. Absolutely. It's really but interesting. It is, but all of the evidence points to this. The moon and the Earth must have formed together. We couldn't capture the moon. That just doesn't work. So if they're formed together, they should be made of the same stuff and they should look the same. They should have the same density. But the moon is less dense than the Earth. It has more of the light material and less of the heavy material. Now, that fits perfectly with the idea of a collision because a collision between an object like Earth and an object like Mars will strip a lot of material from the Earth's mantle and crust and throw that into space. And the mantle and crusts are lighter than the Earth's core. And in fact, the moon looks very much like it was primarily made from material that would have been in the mantle of the Earth and the mantle of the Mars-sized object, Thea. So it all kind of hangs together as a narrative. It's the best explanation we have. And it is still continually being refined as we learn more about the moon and we get more of these pieces of the detective story. It's not the only place, though, that we've had a big collision like that. If we look through the solar system, many of the other planets have similar evidence of big collisions. Mercury, the smallest planet, was probably once twice as large as it currently is now, and it was stripped in a giant collision, much like the Earth was, but it didn't go on to form the moon. Mm -hmm. Venus doesn't have as much water as the Earth nowadays, but it also spins very slowly, and people have suggested that that could be the result of a big collision. Mars may have been smashed into, Uranus may have been knocked over. So whilst we think of the solar system as a fairly calm and quiet place now, it seems that in the final stage of its formation, it was very, very violent and really kind of interesting to follow, interesting to learn about. And during this time, uh, Jonathan, the asteroid belt is very interesting because of all that was going on around it. And was this also connected with Jupiter? The asteroid belt is actually a really interesting piece of evidence into how quickly the planet Jupiter grew right. and tells us a little bit about how planets formed. So where the Earth formed, the temperature was too high for the water vapor in the nebula to condense and become solid. So mm -hmm. it was only the gas phase. Mm -hmm. Now, water is one of the most common things in the universe. It's made of the most common and the third most common element. So there's lots of water everywhere. Where Jupiter is, is just beyond what we call the ice line. It's a location in the solar system where the temperature was cold enough for water to become solid, for water to become ice. And that meant suddenly there was a lot more solid material floating around and planets could grow much more quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's why Jupiter got big enough to swallow all that gas before the gas was cleared away. Right. But as Jupiter got bigger and more massive, its gravitational pull got more impressive, got stronger. And it started stirring up the area around it. And the more massive it got, the more effect it had. And what it did was to stir up all of the rocks, all of the protoplanets that were forming in the asteroid belt, put them onto highly excited orbits, which meant that the average speed of a collision between one and another became so great that instead of them sticking together, they smashed apart. Right. And so Jupiter got big enough, quickly enough, that it prevented a planet forming in the asteroid belt. It started the asteroid belt collisionally grinding away, where the average collision, instead of being sticky, is destructive. And that process carries on to the current day as the asteroids gradually grind away to nothingness. Right. And I think you've, you've written an excellent paper where you've demolished the idea that 
Jupiter, protected Earth from large asteroids during this time. Would you want to tell us a little bit about this? Because I'm sure you've, you've, you've done great work on this. Thank you. Now, it's something I like to talk about a lot because the idea still persists despite our best efforts. And right, it's an right. idea that goes back maybe 40 or 50 years to when we first recognized the impacts could hit the Earth. And that's where the craters and everything came from. And the idea basically goes that even at the current day, Jupiter is really important because it protects the Earth from impacts. And that's hung around. But when I did these studies with my old mentor, Barry Jones, right. um, who unfortunately is no longer with us, neither of us really thought the story was that simple and that straightforward. What actually happens is that Jupiter can throw things towards the Earth that came nowhere near us otherwise, but it can also take things that would hit the Earth and throw them away never to return. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's more of a friend to us or more of a threat actually depends on the balance of does it throw more material our way or does it clear things out? And in fact, in our simulations, if you took Jupiter away entirely, the Earth would be hit less often, right. just fundamentally. What's interesting, though, is even this story gets more complicated because, as I said earlier, the Earth formed in a location where it should have formed dry. The water wasn't able to condense into solids, so while the Earth would have got a little bit of water from water trapped in some of the rocks as they formed, it should have formed primarily dry. So it leaves the question, where did the water come from? Now, Jupiter does throw things in towards the Earth from the outer solar system. It does send things our way. And it's those objects, the comets and the asteroids that may well have delivered some of Earth's water during the last stages of the Earth's formation. So you actually get this interesting situation where without Jupiter, the Earth would have been hit less often. And that could well mean that we would have less water and we possibly wouldn't be the habitable planet that we see today. So these things are always more complicated the more you look at them, I think. And that definitely makes sense because Jupiter on its own, uh, you could call it a planetary system uh, uh, on its own. Because we, I think it's got about 72 or 79 uh, satellites orbiting, right, at last count? Yes, and more to be discovered as well. Jupiter is enormous. It's the biggest thing in the solar system other than the sun. It's a very massive planet, 318 times the mass of the Earth. It's got these spectacular satellites, the Galilean moons and a huge number of what we call irregular satellites. And with every year that passes, that number goes up. The last count was 79, but it wouldn't surprise me if in the coming years we didn't find more. Oh, I'm sure we will. And during this time, if, if we are now at the creation or the uh, post this impact, we now have the Earth. But it is also a fact that most of the planetary systems have, uh, or the star systems, have binary stars. I think that would be more than 75, 80% of it. And is there any proof of this particular formation with us, or the Sun, or the Earth? It seems likely that the solar system formed with the Sun as a single star, but that's not guaranteed. We might have had a binary companion that was lost early on in the Sun's formation, but all of the evidence we have suggests that the sun was a solitary star. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not as unusual as you might think in actuality. The astronomers joke that three in every two stars is a binary, mm -hmm. and that's playing around a little bit with statistics. What they actually mean is that if you look at the stars in the night sky, you see maybe 6,000 stars with the unaided eye. Roughly half of those stars will actually be binary or more, binary, ternary, quaternary, right. two, three, four stars, which means that on average the majority of stars are multiple stars, but about half of stellar systems are single stars. Do you see the differentiation there? It's a little bit hard to get your head around. Good. But roughly half of all stellar systems only have one star in them. And the rest, you've got a lot of binaries, some triples, a small number with four, and so on and so on to higher numbers. I think the highest that is known is probably a seven or an eight star system. But those kind of things are very, very rare. So, Jonathan, connected to this would be the Planet X or and Planet 9. And we've heard a lot of stories about it. It keeps coming back. So how would you uh, clarify this for us? Planet X and Planet 9 is the latest version. It's something that's kind of come and gone throughout exactly. the last 50 or 100 years. Especially, to especially in 2012. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you have all these crazy kind of conspiracy theories crop up in terms of Nibiru and exactly. all these kind of things. In the 1980s, you had the Nemesis theory, exactly. which hung around for a year or two before being shut down. And this was the idea that the sun was a binary star. 
and the albinary companion every 26 million years or so caused the mass extinction on the Earth by throwing comets our way. And that fell down. We would have found such a star. If you go back to the turn of the new millennium, there was an idea that maybe there's a Jupiter mass object in the Oort cloud, this cloud of comets that stretches halfway to the nearest star. Right, there was that and as that, well. I- that idea was Planet X, and that was based around the idea that you see more comets coming from some parts of the sky than others, and that could be the sign that there's a planet there throwing them towards us. Mm-hmm. And that idea seems to have gone away a little bit now, as we've got more data. Then in the last few years, there is an idea of a new planet 9, because Pluto has since been dropped down, so we only have eight planets, so the new planet will be planet 9. Right. And planet 9 is predicted based on the orbits of some of the most distant objects we found in the solar system. Mm -hmm. But already, just a few years after that was suggested as an explanation, there is some debate about whether there really is a planet there or whether there is, once again, another explanation for those unusual objects. So I wouldn't rule out the discovery of another planet mass object in the solar system at some point in the future. But it really is one of these ideas that comes and goes almost like fashion. Sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's not. And during this time, probably before we move on to uh, life and and what happened on planet Earth, during this early phase, it will also be a good time to touch on the formation of stars. Uh, could could we talk about the death of these stars and what happens? You you could explain that as well. Yeah, and um, this is a really interesting thing that gets people very excited. It's the idea that we are stardust essentially. Mm-hmm. The narrative is that when the universe formed in the Big Bang, it was essentially seventy five percent hydrogen. helium and a tiny little bit of lithium and pretty much nothing else. There was a tiny little bit of other stuff. But the stuff that makes up life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, all these heavier elements, there just wasn't enough of them around to form planets, never never mind to form life. Mm. But with every generation of star that lives and dies, you get hydrogen changed, transmuted to helium, helium transmuted to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all through the nuclear furnace at the heart of the star. And this is the process by which stars live and shine. And when they die, when they run out of fuel, they return a lot of that material to the cosmos. And different elements are made in different kinds of stars, primarily. Particularly when you get to the heavy elements. Anything larger, heavier than iron, isn't made by nuclear fusion in a star that's healthy and living its life. It's instead made in supernova explosions, in stars detonating at the end of their lives, massive stars. Lighter elements are made in stars of all masses and return to the cosmos when those stars die, whether that's through the supernova of a massive star or whether it's a star like our sun gently puffing off its outer layers Mm -hmm. after becoming a red giant star. What this means is that with every generation of stars, you take away a little bit of the universe's hydrogen and you add carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. You enrich the heavier elements. And it's those heavy elements that we require to live and to thrive. So we really are stardust. The atoms in your body, particularly the heavier elements, are cooked in the furnaces of stars long dead. And I think that's kind of cool. Oh, I think it's very cool. And would you say that the if we had to talk about the death of a star, uh, and would you categorize it so you have the you would have the white dwarf, you would have a supernova, and the, then you would have a, a how how would you categorize this? The way that stars die varies from star to star, and it depends on how massive the star is. For stars that are the smallest stars, stars like Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor, right. they'll essentially shine forever. Their lives are incredibly long. Proxima will probably live for a trillion years, a wow. thousand, thousand million years. Wow. And when they come to the end of their lives, they'll basically have turned all of their hydrogen to helium and nothing much else will happen. They'll just stop burning hydrogen. They'll cool down and fade to black. Nothing right. much will happen. Right. For a more massive star, a star like the sun, When it runs out of hydrogen in its core, its core will start to collapse again. There's no radiation being made, no fuel being burned to produce more. And as it collapses, it will get hotter and hotter. And that will release energy that will puff the outer layers of the star up. Eventually, it will get hot enough to start burning helium and turning helium into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And that'll support the star for a while. But eventually, it runs out of fuel again. And the core starts to collapse again. And if there isn't enough mass for the star there's nothing more that can happen. It can't get to a high enough temperature and pressure to burn the next set of elements. At that stage, the outer layers of the star will get blown off very gently to form what we call a planetary nebula. I say very gently, it would still be catastrophically bad for any planets around the star, but it's gentle compared to a supernova. And what would be left at the end is what we call a white dwarf. 
it's the size of the Earth, but about the mass of the sun. And that is the core from the star and that, that is left behind. Yeah, this process would uh, swallow the Earth as well. So we are involved in that. Probably. So when the sun swells up to become a red giant star, when it's getting ready to blow off its outer layers, essentially, right. it will swell up to be roughly the size of the Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. Astronomers are a little bit divided on whether the Earth will actually be devoured or whether the Earth will escape and just skim the surface of the sun. But it will certainly be a bad day. Fortunately, the Earth will not be inhabited at that point. The Earth is probably going to become uninhabitable a long, long time before we get to this stage. Sure. So if we want to still be around to see it, we'll have to move away from the Earth. And this would also be a time when, with all of this happening, and you would have had continuous bombardment of asteroids and uh, planetary objects into the Earth's crust. Now, this is a very interesting time because a lot of people are divided here. Did Earth, I mean, did life originate here on planet Earth? Was it some volcanic activity that bought up the, the chemicals that were required for, for life? Or was it part of something that came in from uh, from another planetary body? Uh, whatever the case may be, we don't have a clear picture right now, but we do know what happened after that, right? We do. It's another of these really interesting questions that people are still working at. The final stages of planet formation were very violent. Like you say, there were lots of collisions, lots of impacts. And nobody really knows how and where life began. What we do know, though, is pretty much as soon as the Earth could have life, it had life. It happened fairly quickly. Now, back at that stage of the solar system, Merc sorry, um, Venus, Earth and Mars would all potentially have had the right conditions for life. They would have probably all had oceans. They would all potentially have been warm. And there's an idea that life could have been transferred from one planet to another through the impacts that we're talking about. You have a rock collide with the Earth. It will have the ability to eject rocks from the surface of the Earth to space that could land on Venus and Mars. And in fact, we find Martian meteorites on Earth, not all the time, but we know more than 10 that we found in recent years, mm -hmm. certain that there will be meteorites from the Earth on the surface of Mars. So it may be that life began on one of the three planets and life was passed to the others. That could well have happened. We just don't know yet. So it's not necessarily the case that life began on the Earth, but that's the easiest answer because we know that life's here, so it makes sense that it began here. And there is a lot of work being done by researchers to try and figure out what the history of life is in those very early stages. Where did it begin and how did it begin? There are even, believe it or not, people who are doing research into the definition of life. When is something alive? When is it not yet alive? If you talk to biologists, a lot of them will argue that viruses are not alive. Mm -hmm. They're nearly alive, but they're not actually alive. Again, it's one of these things like I was saying before, a continuum. You have everything from definitely not alive to definitely alive, but there isn't a sharp jump in the middle. We have to put a line somewhere that says one side of this line is not alive, the other side is alive, but we're not quite sure where that is. And the discussion of exactly what the origin of life is is still an open question. There's a lot of thoughts about volcanic calderas and the very chemically rich areas like that or volcanoes under the ocean, like the black and white smokers that you see at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example. And a lot of discussion, too, about life maybe beginning on the beach yes, in an area known as the intertidal zone, Absolutely. the area where sometimes you're underwater and sometimes you're not. And nobody's really got a definitive answer yet. The idea that life began on Venus or Mars is much more controversial, and in a lot of ways is dodging the question because it's really saying we can't work out how life began on Earth, so we're saying it began somewhere else. Well, right. the question is, how did it begin in the other place? And it's probably still a similar kind of process. Like a lot of things in research, it's just a question we don't have an answer for yet. Right, and even more controversial would be Francis Crick's uh, theory of directed panspermia, where uh, we talk about uh, this being actually uh, directed towards Earth, but we we could leave that for now. I, I want to come back to yeah. I, I want to come back to what you just said about uh, uh, life originating on Earth. In that case, if the Earth, uh, or, or if the planet at that ha at that time had all the ingredients for life to happen, what is the possibility that the tree of life that happened? happened more than what we have so if you're looking for other forms of life or other types of life or it could still be here on earth but it may just not be carbon-based and you know but it's still here it just has another 
uh, uh, it just has another uh, progressive line towards it. That's a harder question. We've not seen any evidence of life that is not carbon-based on Earth. And a lot of biologists would argue that you'll only ever get carbon-based life because that's what we see. It's almost certain, though, that there has been life on Earth that we're not aware of because fossilization is a very challenging process. Very little of life actually gets fossilized. But the life that we miss was probably life based on all of the rest of the life. It was part of that tree where we can't see the branches anymore, essentially. Mm -hmm does become interesting though when you think about life elsewhere because we can imagine life with different origins carbon-based life or potentially silicon-based life that's an interesting side topic in a way we can imagine all these things but if we're looking for life on other planets we actually only know of one kind of life which is earth life and so the first things we'll be looking for is life like us that's not saying that we can't imagine other kinds of life it's merely saying that if we want a chance of being able to detect it it makes much more sense to look for something that we do understand rather than looking for something that we've never seen before. Mm, Right, right. And this would also uh, lead us to where we are now currently. I think we we went through this whole loop really well because we started off with when it all started and back to life and how it began. I would like to bring it back to where we are at the moment and probably the, the big change or the big shift happened with the Hubble Space Telescope and what it actually started telling us because that really started looking back in time and we started getting a better picture. Yeah, Hubble has been a really spectacular success, particularly in terms of getting people excited. It's done some beautiful imaging that really allows people to engage with the cosmos. Mm. The Big Bang Theory actually dates back much further. It dates back to observations that were done by a lot of astronomers around the turn of the 20th century, so in the early 1900s. And people like Vespas Blyfer, um, Edwin Hubble, people like that. And Hubble is famous as being the person who popularized this. Though it should be noted that the Hubble law that we grew up learning about is now renamed as a Hubble and Maitre law to recognize another scientist that came up with it independently. And those observations were that when you look at galaxies beyond our own, And beyond the ones that are closest to us, what we call the local group, those galaxies are receding from us, they're moving away. And the further away they are, the faster they're moving. And that was evidence that in the past the universe was smaller, and that was the evidence that initially led towards the Big Bang. Now, one of the big predictions of the Big Bang model would be, therefore, as you look back further in time, the universe will get hotter because it was smaller. In the same way that we talked about when you squash everything in to make a star, the temperature goes up and you get the star. And there was a lot of debate in the 1950s and 60s about whether the Big Bang or the steady state model was the best explanation for the universe. But in, I think it was 1963, two astronomers called Penzias and Wilson accidentally stumbled across the afterglow of the Big Bang, something we call the cosmic microwave background. Now, if you imagine looking out in all directions, you're looking back in time because the light takes a long time to reach us. So eventually, if you look far enough, you're looking back towards times close to the Big Bang when the universe was much hotter. Now, about 300,000 years after the universe formed, after the Big Bang explosion, the gas in the universe finally dispersed enough that it was no longer opaque, it became transparent. Before that, you just couldn't see through it. It was like a thick fog. And at that point, you suddenly have the ability for light to just travel and not be stopped, not be interrupted. So that's the last surface we can see looking back. And that's what the cosmic microwave background is. We're seeing the wall of fog in the distant past. Right, that would be the cosmic dawn or the first light that we're all looking for, right? Yes. And you see this at microwave wavelengths, which are far infrared. And because it's very redshifted, because it's moving away very quickly, it has a temperature of less than 3 Kelvin. Even though at the time, the temperature would have been far, far higher than that. You're talking millions of degrees but the redshifting makes it look a lot cooler, so it looks like it's just a few Kelvin. And this would be the same as the Doppler effect, something that we see with either a siren passing through or uh, sound waves that uh, the further they move, uh, the voice voice goes down, right? Yeah, so that's the Doppler effect, and you get the same thing with light. If something's moving away from you, the light from it is shifted a little bit to the red. The faster it's moving, the more that it's shifted to the red. So the further away you are in the universe, the faster you're moving away from us, so the more to the red your light is shifted. This is called the redshift, and it's how we measure the expansion of the universe, and it's how we get a feel for the distance to very distant galaxies. We can work out how redshifted they are, we can work out how far away they are, 
and use that to track, to trace the expansion of the universe. And and this was probably the time for the cosmological constant. And, and, and why did Einstein call it his biggest mistake? Maybe you could tell us. So when Einstein built his theories of special and general relativity, it didn't quite sit with the the understanding of cosmology at the time. Because remember, this predates those observations of an expanding universe. Right. And what he realized was essentially that his equations will predict that the universe should be collapsing in on itself. It sh- gravity should be pulling everything together. Exactly. Or it should be expanding and gravity slowing that expansion down. They're the only two possibilities because it couldn't be static. But that didn't make sense with the cosmology he had at the time. So he put in this thing called a cosmological constant mm-hmm. to offset that effect. And then, of course, in the decades that followed, it became clear that the universe actually was expanding. And that was why he said it was his biggest mistake. But it may be that he had his last laugh. Right. Because recent observations that led to the Nobel Prize for people like Brian Schmidt Correct. actually point out that the expansion of the universe is speeding up rather than slowing down. Right. And that's one of the bits of evidence for something called dark energy. And that essentially puts into those equations a cosmological constant term. So it may be that even though he viewed it as a big mistake, Einstein may have actually been correct in that. Right. And that was also probably the time. And when was the time rather than we had a good understanding of the four forces of nature and, and when they came together, whether it's the, the strong force, the weak force, uh, gravity. Yeah. So that understanding has developed over the last century. And I, I wouldn't say it's perfect yet because I think there's always more to learn. The models we have for all the different forces are perfectly adequate to explain everything that we can currently observe, and they make predictions for what we can observe in the future. And a good example of this is Newton's laws of gravitation from the 1600s. Right. They were a spectacularly good tool at predicting the orbits of planets and everything else to the level at which people could measure it at the time. And in fact, for more than 200 years afterwards, it was only in the late 1800s and early 1900s that the cracks began to appear because we'd finally pushed to a level beyond the accuracy for which Newton's laws are accurate. It was things like the precession of the orbit of Mercury, how quickly Mercury's orbit wobbles around the sun. Newton's laws is no longer an accurate description of the universe, but it's a very good approximation. Mm -hmm. And Einstein's theorems are what gives us the most accurate explanation of that behavior. It can predict things going forward, and it's probably the most tested theory of all time. But there remains the possibility that we will eventually reach a level where we can observe where those theories break down, where they're no longer perfectly accurate, and we might need a better theory again. And that's why I always have a little bit of a caveat when people think that we've reached a final understanding. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have. We're we're a step on the journey, but we're not at the end of the journey yet. Absolutely. And that would be the theory of everything if and when it does come to be, right? Absolutely. But I'm sure after the theory of everything, there'll be the theory of everything too, (laughs) the theory inning or something like this. And it will be a new revised, better version. And I always found it interesting when I got to know that out of the three forces, gravity is actually the weakest force because somehow it's a bit difficult to imagine that, you know, whatever's holding all of this together, we then say it's the weakest force. It is the weakest force, but it's the only one that always pulls in the same direction as far as we know. We've never yet found anti-gravity. Correct. So with the other forces the things that generate them require a certain type of charge, positive or negative. So in terms of the electric force, you have electrical charge. You have things that are magnetic, generating Mm. magnetic Mm. fields and moving electrical particles. With gravity, everything has mass. We haven't found things with negative mass yet. So what that means is that the charge for the other things cancels out. North and south poles for magnets cancel each other out. And on average, we think the universe has no overall electrical or magnetic charge, which is why... Most of the time, electrical forces and magnetic forces aren't that relevant. On the Earth, however, we've got gravity. And the difference is that gravity, everything has positive mass, so gravity always pulls, it never pushes. And so even though it's the weakest of the forces, there is far more of the thing generating the force around, and so it's much more obvious. The fact that gravity is really weak, you can demonstrate if you get two magnets. You can get two tiny little magnets the size of your thumbnail and the magnetic force between them is strong enough to override gravity right. you can pick one magnet up with the other and lift it up so a tiny magnet of just a few grams can exert a bigger magnetic force than the entire mass of the earth exerts a gravitational force that's and be- how weak gravity is 
Right. And when you say we've pretty much recently figured out that the universe is actually accelerating as it expands, uh, this brings in the the concept or something that a lot of people are interested in is, and that is uh, dark energy, where dark energy actually plays a part, whether it's at the level of this expansion that is happening. Yeah, and it's one of these things that nobody really fully understands yet. A lot of ideas have been put forward for what it is and how it works. But it's, I guess, something that we are pretty certain is there unless our laws of the universe are wrong, which is always a possibility. But we can't really see it. I guess the analogy here would be if you imagine standing outside on a windy day, you can feel the effects of the wind blowing against you, pushing you around, but you can't see the wind Mm -hmm. unless you've got a really dusty day. Dark energy is a bit like that. We can see the effects of dark energy, but we can't see dark energy itself yet. And that's another one for the coming decades to really disentangle. Definitely. And along with that would be dark matter. Absolutely. And again, dark matter is something where we can see the effects, but we don't know what it is yet. There's a lot of research being put into this, but we see dark matter in the form of galaxies and clusters of galaxies that are behaving as though there is a stronger gravitational pull on them than we can explain from all of the matter that we can see. So therefore, there has to be matter that we can't see, which is dark matter. Really, it's that simple. Right. And if we get back to life where we left off last, and uh, we do say that, it, let's say, it started off here, then the next question, I think, would be if we need to move out. Uh, where would we move out to and what's going to happen once we move out? So that would be the first. I think the nearest possibility would be the moon for us to probably start setting up something there so that we can understand how how we react to to, uh, living in space for more than six months. Uh, We would have to start moving in that direction and I think things are happening, right? They are and we're looking more and more at living beyond the Earth. It's a remarkable fact that the last time there were no humans living in space was in 2002. Right. Since then, there have been people on the space station continually, without a break. And that's kind of cool. In terms of moving off Earth, there are a lot of problems to overcome. And we may move to the Moon and Mars, and also to asteroids, as a first step on that journey. There are problems with that, though, and a lot of people have suggested that Mars will be the retirement home of the future. Mm. Because one of the big unanswered questions is how we reproduce in space, whether it's on the moon, on Mars, on asteroids. Not the physical process of conceiving a child, but right. whether it will be possible to carry a child, whether pregnancy is possible right. under such different conditions. Because on Earth, we have 1G of gravity. We have the acceleration due to gravity pulling us down. Correct. And I never realized this until I saw a fabulous talk from a doctor a few years ago. Even slight changes in those conditions are enough to make people have great problems having children. If we struggle to have children because you're suddenly living in the mountains, is it really reasonable to think that we'll be able to reproduce when we're living on Mars with one-third gravity? It's a little bit of a leap. So a lot of people have said, because of this, our first motion to space and our first inhabiting of other worlds will be people who have had their children and are now looking for a new challenge, a new adventure in the latter years of their lives. Or you'll have people going to work in space and then coming back to Earth to have families. There is a big biological hurdle to get before we can fully move off Earth and survive off Earth as a species. And nobody's really got an answer for that yet, but it's another interesting question for the coming decades. Sure, and I think uh, what what Chandrayaan has done, uh, the Chandrayaan Mission 2, uh, recently is it's, it's going to be the first uh, satellite that's actually going to land on the... Uh, south pole of the moon and it's carrying an orbiter it's got a, a lander module it's got a, a a wheel rover a six wheel rover as well and what it will do is it's going to study the topography the seismology uh, mineral identification and temperatures whereby uh, the the ultimate aim is to see what kind of liquids or water is available on that part of 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 the southern uh, pole of the moon but this particular mission has been quite interesting for a lot of people here in india because considering the scale of it uh, you know it's 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 huge because we've we've actually sent up a, a 43 meter tall uh, rocket and it, its payload is about uh, 4000 kg so i think that's that's something that we're all looking at at the moment it's a breathtaking achievement and something that i can imagine people feel incredibly proud of it actually came to our attention here in Australia 
17 minutes after it launched Whoa. because the second burn of the rocket was widely observed across the eastern half of Australia. Okay. Gave a spectacular view for people, and that really got people excited last week. I think it's really remarkable that 50 years ago, we had the first people walking on the moon, and at that point, it was just the US and Russia that was doing it. Everybody else were observers. And we're now in a stage where China and India are both actively exploring the moon, and we're moving to a future where more and more countries are doing this, and there's fabulous work going on. And Chandrayaan is a great testament to that, and it's a fabulous credit to the Indian space research that's going on, I think. Right. And I think uh, besides the uh, governments that are doing, I think the private sector is moving in quickly because Jeff Bezos is going to be the next uh, one to land on, not he himself, but his mission called the Blue Origin is going to land the South Pole as well. So that makes it even more ex- exciting because you have SpaceX as well. Yeah, it's one of the great changes that we're seeing at the moment is space exploration becoming a commercial enterprise rather than just a government thing. And this is because the cost of space has finally become commercially viable. And I think it's going to drive in the future a lot more exploration because people are now seeing profit in it. And as soon as you see profit in it, there is a reason to do it, a reason to invest. And I'd like to see that we could even have in the next 20 years a new space race where it isn't US versus USSR, but it's rather different companies pushing out there and different countries pushing out there to try and see what they could learn and to see what they can claim sector. Right, right. I'm I'm sure there's a lot going to come out of that. And I just wanted to check with you. You must have been quite excited when you saw the first pictures of the first real pictures of of a black hole. That must have been exciting, right? That was very cool. And there was an Australian component to that. Right, there was. a fabulous research group just down the hill from where I live at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. And one of the researchers there, Professor Tamara Davis, was integral to that. So again, this is one of those projects that is a global effort that researchers around the world do. But where there are researchers in your own backyard who are doing it makes it a little bit more personal, a little bit more involved. So for me, that was a wonderful discovery, but it was all the more exciting because I knew the people involved and I could empathize with their excitement and their investment in this project. I thought it was fabulous. Right. And it was a collaborative effort, right? They were they were beaming uh, from different parts of, of the globe and then they had to collect all this data. It took some time to get this uh, data together. But finally, what did happen was quite significant. It was. It was one of the greatest astronomical observations ever carried out. It required coordination on a global level because you needed telescopes in different countries, radio telescopes, to be observing their target at exactly the same time and to have their data coming together so that you could match it up to within like a millisecond or even a microsecond. So you could say this photon that this telescope observed came in at the same time as this one from this telescope on the other side of the Earth. In order to use those telescopes to pretend to synthesize a radio telescope the size of our planet. And that was what was needed to make this observation. So it really was remarkable and just an incredible achievement. And again, an incredible human endeavor that required people to look beyond borders and to work just as a global community. Absolutely. And I think uh, collaboration will be the key to moving out, like you say, if we do have to go and move to other places where we would want to live post uh, leaving Earth. But this would also then just want I, I just want to get back to this particular fact and talk about a little bit about the Goldilocks zone. And uh, what does that mean when it comes to planets that you're looking for? And you would think that could be uh, supportive to life if we move from here to from Earth. Yeah, the Goldilocks zone is something that I think is a little bit misleading or at least poorly explained by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It comes from this idea that if you have a planet going around its star, if the planet's too close to the star, it will be too hot for liquid water to happen on the surface. If it's too far away, it will be too cold. But in the middle, there's this place where it's just right. A bit like the porridge in the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, who have the... Yeah, the same idea. The problem is that everybody uses this as a way of saying, we're looking for planets in the Goldilocks zone, and they Mm -hmm. do calculations and say this planet could be the right temperature. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit misleading because what it actually means is that if you took the Earth as it is today with the atmosphere it has today and put it in that planetary system as the Earth is today, the Earth would still look like the Earth. And the reason that's a little bit misleading, I think, is that if you look at the Earth 4 billion years ago, 4,000 million years ago, the sun at that point was 30% less bright than it is today, less luminous. So the Earth with its current atmosphere would freeze. So the Earth, when life first began on the Earth, was barely in the Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. 
And what it's highlighting really is that before we can draw these conclusions about which planets could have life on them, we need to learn more about the planets. The reason we go to the Goldilocks zone is because we don't have enough information and we've got to say something, we've got to guess, we've got to estimate. And for me, I'd rather wait until we can learn a little bit more. For example, if you swapped Venus and Mars around in the solar system, both of them will probably be habitable. They'd both probably be in the Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. Venus, as it is today, is too close to the sun. It's too hot. It's got this incredibly thick atmosphere. But if you put Venus where Mars is further from the sun, it will cool down and it might still be a suitable place for life. Similarly, Mars is too small to have held onto an atmosphere. It's pretty cold there now. It's too cold for life, potentially. But if you moved it closer to the sun and put it where Venus is, it will probably be plenty warm enough. And the take home from this is that, like everything, the story is more complicated than you might think. And depending on the planet, there's a lot of things that could contribute to it being suitable for life or not suitable for life. And they're the kind of things we want to learn in the years to come. Even if you did, like you said, swap the planets around and you're looking at life, it then brings in the concept of fine-tuning for, for life because of the fact on uh, where we are placed and how we are placed, right? Yes. but And a lot of people have used this to argue some case of predetermination for life. Whereas, in fact, it's probably the result of the fact that we're here to observe it. That's that the, the Earth is so tuned for us, because if the Earth wasn't perfectly suited to life like us, we wouldn't be here to observe it. That's the anthropic so principle. Have, yes, absolutely. And so it's a really challenging one. It's almost a chicken and egg type discussion right. of, is the Earth perfectly suitable for life because we're here to observe it, or are we here to observe it because the Earth is perfectly suited for life? And I tend to come down on the second one. If, if we were one of those imaginary different types of life we were talking about before, and we required a very different planet to the one we live on now, mm -hmm. we would think that was normal because that would be where we've grown up. So we would have a totally different idea of the Goldilocks zone yeah. because it would be based on where we lived. And we would think that where we lived was perfect for life. And you had to have all the things that go along with that in order for life to thrive. And we're moving into very, very interesting areas now because we're actually coming back down to possibilities of alien life. And I just want to know your thoughts without me saying anything. It's an interesting one. I think there will be life elsewhere, but it might not be close enough for us to find. So this is the big question for me is based around how likely it is for life to get started. And my logic goes as follows. Our galaxy alone has something like 400,000 million stars. And we now know that all of those stars have planets. So we probably have more than a trillion planets in our galaxy. There are more galaxies in the universe than there are planets in our galaxy. There are probably more galaxies in the universe than there are grains of sand in our galaxy. And each of those galaxies will have trillions of planets on its own. So that says that there is an incredible, unbelievably large amount of real estate out there where life could be. And it strikes me as being highly improbable that only on one planet out of those encountered worlds could life get going. Mm -hmm. But the question then becomes, well, how common is life? If life is out there, but it's not that common... It may be that the closest planet to the Earth that also has life is so far away we'll never be able to detect it. And the more common life is, the closer the nearest inhabited world will be. And so what I think we'll find in the coming decades as we search for life beyond the Earth and life in the galaxy is that we'll be getting a feel for how easy it is for life to get started. Mm -hmm. And that will tell us how close the nearest inhabited worlds would be. If we think about intelligent communicative life, I think that's the hardest to find. It may be that we're the only life like that in our galaxy. Because if you look at the Earth, we've had life on Earth for three and a half thousand million years or more. But we've only had life that could communicate with the cosmos for less than a hundred years. And in terms of the edge of our planet, that's a blink of an eye. And we're already getting very good at hiding our existence again. Instead of broadcasting our broadcasts in all directions, we send them down cables. We have point to point communication suddenly we're not spilling noise to the cosmos anymore. If we were to find intelligent life, though, I kind of always think we might find silicon life before we find carbon life. Mm -hmm. And this is going down the science fiction route a little bit, but it's based on what we're doing. We talked about Chandrayaan. We have all these incredible robotic missions going out through the solar system. And as time goes on, they're getting more complicated and more able to make their own decisions. Because if you're orbiting Jupiter you have a light travel time 
of nearly half an hour. If you need to make a decision quickly, you can't send a message home saying, what should I do? Wait for a response because it will be too late. And the further you travel, the more autonomous you need to be because the time delay to get an answer is so long. So what we're doing is we're developing ever more autonomous, ever more complicated spacecraft. And it's not a far stretch from that to imagine we start developing spacecraft with artificial intelligence on them in order to do their target selection, their imaging themselves to save time and be more effective. We will be sending spacecraft like that out to the cosmos a long time before we start to travel to other stars in person. And if other species do the same thing, there's going to be a, a lot of intelligent spacecraft out there that we're likely to find before we might find the intelligent aliens. Right. So it's a little bit science fiction, but I could see if we imagine our future, we will be sending intelligent spacecraft to the stars a long time before we send humans to the stars. And so we'll be polluting the galaxy with silicon-based life before we send carbon-based life out to follow it. If there is a possibility that it is happening from the other side as well, and maybe you want to tell us about the, the wow signal. That was quite interesting when it happened. It was, and there's always going to be things like this. We talk about UFOs all the time, unidentified flying objects. There will always be things that we observe for which we don't immediately have an explanation. And in the case of UFOs, most of them very quickly become IFOs, identified flying objects, exactly. when we work out what the explanation is. And the wow signal is one of these things. It was an unusual spike of radio emission that was observed just once that has never been repeated. And people have struggled to find an explanation, but the problem is without it being repeated, it's very hard to test the different theories to explain it should be said that life is very much a long shot in terms of the explanation. In fact, the most likely explanation is that it may well just have been an unknown spy satellite flying over or something like this. Right. But there may well one day be a case where we get a signal like the WOW signal. And the only explanation that remains after we knock all of the other ones down is that that signal comes from aliens. And that's the idea behind SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It's looking for the needle in the haystack it's listening for the very, very unlikely event that we detect a signal from another species somewhere in the cosmos. It's very unlikely, but if we ever do it, it will be a, an enormous discovery and very exciting. It was exciting probably about a year ago. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Umuwa Mua. That was fun, and your pronunciation of that's probably better than mine. It's <laughs> named after a deity from um, the Hawaiian From the Hawaiian continent, continent yeah. Pantheon. Yeah. yeah, and it was a deity who was a scout, who was an explorer. And this was the first ever detected interstellar object, something passing through our solar system that didn't originate in our solar system. It was a comet or an asteroid that was born around another star, was flung from that star's environment, probably by a planet like Jupiter, sailed through the dark of co the cosmos, the empty, inky blackness of space for untold millions of years, and just happened to fly past the Earth as it toured through the galaxy. And it will be the first of many in coming years as we get better surveys, like the LSST, the Large Synoptic Scale, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. We will find more of these objects because they'll be passing through the solar system all the time. Space is littered with debris like this. And Umau Mau was just the first one that we discovered, but it was really exciting and opened our eyes to a whole new type of object. Well, Jonathan, I just would, would like to ask you, what are the things that you in your field, what are you excited about? What, what's what's coming next? How, how do you see us moving and, and other areas that you think are going to be breakthrough? There are. I think the search for planets around other stars is something I'm involved with. I do a lot of work on. And in that field, I think the big breakthrough will come when we start to find planets that are truly like the Earth. We get a lot of stories saying we've found the most Earth-like planet yet, but we're not quite there yet. We've not found another Earth. We might have found planets like Venus. We might have found planets like Jupiter. And we're getting closer and closer to that enormous discovery of another planet like our own. And I guess those stories of finding another Earth, of finding the most Earth-like planet, is like looking at the life on Earth, imagining imaging the life on Earth from a very good satellite. Each time you find an animal that is a bit smaller, you'd say, well, it's the most human-like animal. We found a giraffe. Well, now we found a rhino. Well, now we found a lion. Now we found a dolphin. And each time it's a little bit closer to a human, so you could say it's the most human-like animal. But we haven't detected a human yet. And that's what we're doing with the search for planets around the stars. We're getting closer to finding planets that are really like the Earth. But we're not there yet. And I think in the next decade, we'll really start to get an answer for how common planets like the Earth are, and that's really exciting. But that also sets the scene 
for us to start studying those planets and look for the evidence of life upon them. And I think in the next decade or two, we'll start to be able to answer the question that I had about how common life is in the cosmos. Is there really life nearby? Or are the planets that we're finding around other stars when we start finding those Earth-like planets, are they barren? Is life less common? And I think we're going to be getting an understanding of that over the next 10 or 20 years. And that, to me, is probably the most exciting thing I'm directly involved with. And a lot of my research is built on trying to help that process along, trying to help better characterize what's important for life, or trying to help search for those planets. So in my own field, that's probably the most exciting thing, I think. And are you worried about, are you concerned about something? I'm not really. I mean, I think we have, as a species, this incredible passion for learning and this incredible desire to know more about the universe. And I think that will continue to drive us to keep doing this exploration, keep doing these studies. I mean, obviously, I'm concerned about us answering some of the problems that face us here on Earth, solving problems like climate change. And we're having this chat after the UK, where I grew up, just experienced its second hottest day on record at a time when the polar caps are melting incredibly quickly, absolutely, where climate has become a severe concern. And I would say that I am worried about that. But I don't think that concern detracts for me from the excitement I feel about our exploration of the cosmos and the exploration of the solar system. I think it's possible to be concerned about it, but not worried about our future as a whole, because I think our drive to know and to understand will hopefully help us find the answers that allow us to survive through these problems and come out on the other side smiling, I guess. And with all these explorations being sent out into space, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on, you know, space debris? And you have a a lot of it now. We've got over maybe 5,000 satellites currently orbiting the Earth. And uh, do we need to manage this better moving forward? And do we have to start thinking about certain regulations, global regulations, and who sends what? I think that's something that we'll have to look at in the coming years now. Orbital space around the Earth is just not policed at the minute. They, people can put things up there with no problems whenever they want to, so long as they can overcome the technological hurdles. And this is why you now have Elon Musk looking at launching 12,000 satellites. You have Amazon, Jeff Bezos, looking at launching 10,000 satellites. And the more you put up there, the more risk there is of collisions and of this catastrophic breakdown of orbital space where you have so much debris that it becomes totally unsafe. That's something that we're going to have to address in the coming years. And I think it will be interesting to see how different nations and different companies pull together to solve that problem and to try and understand how you limit things, how you control things, how you manage things. And it might well take some fairly catastrophic events like some satellites being knocked out and a collision or cascade happening before people really get involved in trying to fix the problem. But it is something we're going to have to address in coming years. Right. And and talking about... uh... Elon Musk and his plan with, uh, I think it's called Starlink, he's already launched 60 satellites. And uh, the, the idea there is to, to, to have global uh, internet connectivity at higher speeds. And, and, and uh, another thing is, in, in fact, his Bill Falcon rocket, he's planning to send a Japanese billionaire to the moon as well. Of the 60 satellites he launched, a large number of them are no longer operating already. Mm-hmm. So it shows that there are problems to overcome still. And it's finding that balance between the ambition and the imagination, but also doing it in a way that is sustainable and not damaging. And that's where a lot of people are a little bit concerned about Starlink, is the risk that this kind of expansion unmitigated, this kind of expansion unmoderated, could be problematic because you run into the problems before you think of how to solve them. And I think that's where the concerns come through. The motivation, of course, is money it's driven commercially Mm. by the fact that if you have a network of satellites that provide global internet people pay your fee to use them he projected making 30 billion dollars in the first few years from that so there's a large financial incentive for him to do it and it'll be interesting to see at what point the incentive to do this is offset by the costs involved if you start getting satellites getting knocked out of orbit all the time and you get poor service will that cause him to reevaluate it and think of ways to mitigate the risk I think a lot of this is going to be driven commercially in the future. Yeah, I think it would also probably interfere with uh, work being done by astronomers when it comes down to radio signaling specifically, right? It'll be problematic for radio signaling. It'll be difficult as well for the large-scale surveys like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, Correct. where they're trying to survey the entire sky. For astronomers doing the kind of work I'm doing where we're looking for planets around the stars, it will be less problematic. Mm. The likelihood of a satellite passing across the star you're observing 
is still very, very small. But for the wider field surveys, for other branches of astronomy, it's going to be a problem, and that's something that needs to be taken into account as well. Like I say, it's a really complex situation, and I don't think anybody has the answers yet. But simply the fact we're having this discussion is a real step in the right direction, because the first step in solving a problem is recognizing that there is a problem. Absolutely. But I think he's balanced it out with the uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket because there's some interesting things happening there. And I just I, I wouldn't know if you're aware, but they're going to be actually sending uh, 3D printers on that rocket into space. And they're trying to print soft tissues, uh, soft tissues for the human body, which would otherwise, because of gravity, be difficult to do here on Earth. So I think progressively this is uh, a step in the right direction as well, because wh- who knows that this we may come back with some information regarding that. Absolutely. I think there are going to be a lot of positives come out of this exploration. And like I say, I I certainly could never question Elon Musk's imagination and his ambition. And I think there's a lot of good things to come. It's just going to be interesting to see how we deal with that commercialization of space as it does move from being a government run thing from different governments launching satellites in a fairly small scale fashion to having tens of thousands of satellites going up and different commercial providers putting things up there. It's almost going to be a little bit like the Wild West all over again at first until we work out the legalities and the logistics of it. And it's just going to be very interesting times. Yeah, it's already started because uh, Adidas is sending a football to see how spherical objects rotate in space. So there you go. Yeah, there's a lot of marketing things going on as well. There is a lot of concern in the astronomical community about people launching giant space billboards to try and reach a wider audience and the damage that would have to the night sky. So there's a lot of good and a lot of bad to come and it'll be interesting to see like say in 20 years time what the landscape looks like what's up there and how everything's working right and if you had to take a pick uh, uh, besides the moon with what you currently uh, are looking at what would be a particular planet or a particular zone that or an area that you'd be looking at for for us to to move to in the future i think In terms of that commercial exploration, which I think will drive things, asteroids are actually where it's at, because you can go and mine asteroids and send material back to Earth very cheaply. And in fact, asteroid mining will probably work out being more commercially viable than mining the moon. So I think from the commercial side, that's going to be where it's at. In terms of human exploration, the moon and Mars are probably going to be the first places that we'd look at. But one mission I'm particularly excited about is actually the Dragonfly mission that NASA is going to send to Saturn's moon Titan. We're going to send a flying drone that will be able to explore the only other object in the solar system that has permanent liquid on its surface. That's going to be amazing. Exposed to the air. That's going to be incredible. And that kind of technological development will have trickled down into day-to-day life as well, because to develop something like that, you build so much new technology, you push the boundaries, and that ends up impacting everybody in their day-to-day lives down the line after the event right right i know that we are limited with time i'm saying limited with time though we've we've kept talking i've, I've not realized actually i'm just looking at the clock now i would want to ask you about uh, uh, jonathan voyager one where how far is it and what's the status now and what can it turn back and look at it's incredibly far away actually i'm just going to double check the numbers here because they're so mind-blowing i don't want to get them wrong but voyager one is currently so far away that the light from it takes more than 20 hours to get back to us. I'm just going, this is great, you can listen to somebody looking things up on the internet, but you can go to the Voyager status page on the Jet Propulsion Labs website. You just do a search for Voyager status, and you should be able to find this. And for both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, it has counters that are continually ticking up in terms of the elapsed time of the missions. We're currently 41 years and 11 months, 41 years and 10 months. Mm-hmm. The distance from the Earth in both miles and astronomical units. So I'll give you the distance for Voyager 1, which is a more distant in miles. It's 13 trillion, 554 million, 34,689. And that number's going up wow. by 10 or 15 miles per second. Those last three digits are now 860. Wow. They're now 910. That's, That's amazing. That's how fast this thing's traveling. As we're um, talking, it's moving. It is. Oh, wow. To put that in perspective, it is nearly 146 times further from the sun than we are. That's wow. another way of wow. putting it. It's just incredible. Um, and it's currently traveling at, at the slow speed of 38,000 miles per hour. Wow. What that means is that when we get a signal back from Voyager 1, we receive that now. That signal left the spacecraft 20 hours ago. Amazing. 
It's incredible. And the fact we're still listening into this is a technological achievement beyond many that you can imagine, because that, as we say, is, what was it, 13 and a half trillion miles away. Amazing. And it's broadcasting back to us with the power of one watt. Amazing. And we can hear it. It's Amazing. just incredible. And and you say to, it's broadcasting to us about uh, from 20 hours ago, putting that into perspective for a lot of our listeners, the light reaching us from the sun just left uh, eight minutes ago. And then you can look at the distances we are talking about. Yes, absolutely. But it still tells you the challenge we face in going to other stars. Voyager 1 is the most distant object, the furthest thing we've ever launched. It was launched 41 years ago, like I say, and it is now 20 light hours away. Light would take 20 hours to reach it from Earth. The nearest star is four and a quarter light years away. So in 40 years of travel, we haven't even got one light day. We haven't therefore even got one twelve hundredth of the distance to the nearest star. Well, so putting it another way, Voyager 1 would take more than 50,000 years to reach the nearest star, traveling as quickly as it is. It's just astonishing when you when you start thinking about those kind of speeds and those kind of distances. Uh, the moment you talk in light years, uh, I, I kind of uh, lose track. Absolutely. It's one of the things that scares people a bit. Space is so incredibly vast. These distances are so great. It's just really hard to get your head around. But we are making steps that way. We will one day have spacecraft approaching other stars that we launched. Leave it long enough and Voyager will get there, but I'm sure before Voyager reaches the stars, other spacecraft we launch will do first because we'll get better at it, we'll be able to go quicker. And you never know, one day in the long distance future, we might be receiving images back to the Earth from a spacecraft orbiting another star. That would be really cool. I don't think it will happen in my lifetime, but it's great to think and imagine the far future like that. No, oh, absolutely. As we wind down to a close here, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you, you were running a, an, an exhibition. And how did that go? Would you want to tell my listeners what, what you were doing and what that whole exhibition was all about? Well, we had a couple of things. I organise every year with my colleagues at the University of Southern Queensland, a festival of astronomy. And that's just an opportunity to engage with the public, much like we are doing today, to actually get people excited and particularly get the young people of the area engaged with science and see that this is something they could do. What we also had earlier this week, though, was that we had the launch of our new facility searching for planets around other stars. This is something called Minerva Australis. And we've been putting this together for the last few years. During the 12 months before this official launch, where we were commissioning it, where we were making sure everything worked okay, we've already contributed to the discovery of 13 new alien worlds. And now that we're fully operational, in the coming years, we'll discover tens, if not hundreds, working in collaboration with NASA and with colleagues all across the planet. So I'm very excited about that, and it's going to be big news in the years to come. Oh, that's amazing, because we at uh, Indian Genes have started with the same intention to promote uh, information, ideas, and science, if we can, to a lot of our young listeners, make it more accessible to them. And having said that, if uh, one of my young listeners wanted to ask you, what does he do? And what is the direction he should take if he wants to move down this road of, of uh, astronomy? What would your advice be? My advice would be, do what you love. That's the most important thing. I'm very lucky that I get to do my hobby as a job. And if this person's passionate about this field, try to study, try to get into it. There's a wealth of information now online, both good resources and bad, it should be said. You need to be careful where you're reading where you can learn a lot about the cosmos. And I write for a website regularly called The Conversation, which is a free public research website, essentially. So whenever there's a new science story or a new politics story, they have researchers write the story of what's happening in language you can understand, aimed at the target audience, but written by people who are experts in that field. So you can guarantee that you're getting the right message. So go to websites like that and you'll have a fair and accurate representation of the science that's been done that you can trust. If they wanted to know what to study when they go to university, right. the advice I got when I was in their shoes was essentially that you can't be a mechanic without learning to use a spanner, mm -hmm. that you need to learn the tools for the job in order to be able to do the job. And that advice, I studied physics at university in order to become an astronomer. That was the advice I was given because physics gives you the tool set to unpack the universe, to actually learn how everything works. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to do astronomy without a solid knowledge of physics. So physics and maths are really important, 
but that doesn't mean you have to be really passionate and really love the physics and the maths. You can love cars without loving the spanner, but you can't repair the car without the spanner. Right. You can love astronomy without loving physics and maths, but your love of astronomy can be what drives you to study physics and maths. That's not to say that if you do love physics and maths, that's a bad thing. In fact, quite the opposite. The more excited you are and passionate about what you're studying, the easier it is to study and the better you'll do. But if I was giving someone advice on what to do to try and get into astronomy as a field, it would be make sure that you study the physics and the maths because they'll give you the skills you need, like I say, to unpack the cosmos. So, Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, I've not looked at the watch at all. I've just realized that you're on the other end. It's even my colleague here who is with me in the recording studio is has been sitting on on her seat and hasn't moved because she's so engrossed with everything you're saying so we are taking a few notes down as well i think we've had a great time jonathan i just hope that you spent your time well as well i did it was absolutely fabulous to talk to you and i can't wait to hear the podcast and i hope you get the fabulous reach for this that you clearly are anticipating so it's brilliant to be here and thank you for having me thank you so much jonathan thank you